trash. It smells like a clean room. Excuse me, ladies, hello. We now call to order meeting of the ladies' auxiliary of the Capo and the Rev Classics rendition of Anne of Green Gables. Here in chapter 12, a solemn vow and promise. Anne had kept a lid on the hat she'd worn to Sunday school as far as Marilla Cuthbert was concerned. Word had caught wildfire as Missy Rogerson lodged a formal complaint with the ladies' auxiliary who would seemingly instantaneously put their full attention towards his new orphan Anne and the Cuthberts at Green Gables. Normally, word would have gotten to Marilla like the snap of a finger at a boot black, but things were changing in Avonlea. It was not until the next Friday that Marilla heard the story of the flower-wreathed hat. She came home from Mrs. Lynn's and called Anne to account. Anne, Mrs. Rachel Lynn says you went to church last Sunday with your hat rigged out with ridiculous roses and buttercups. What on earth put you up to such a caper? Oh, I know pink and yellow aren't becoming to me. Becoming fiddlesticks. It was putting flowers on your hat at all. No matter what color they are. Marilla was becoming noticeably upset. This was ridiculous. You are the most aggravating child. Well, Marilla, normally I wouldn't have much to say about a scandal like this, but over the past week I've developed a rash down the back of my neck, and every time it's itched me I've wondered if it was God reminding me of my indomitable vanity. Yet then I remember the story of Job, and so I've decided to take it as a blessing, for it's far less smarting than a rap from Missy Rogerson's <laughs> rod. My girl, I worry for you that if you should look back now, you might turn into a pillar of salt. Can you imagine how romantic that must have been, Marilla? To stand forever as a mighty pyre, looking back upon a mysterious lost life? Anne stood still as a statue, smiling widely at Marilla. Oh, you'll be looking back onto a lost life, Miss Anne, with an E, surely, while carrying a double armload of bluet children with you. Marilla said slyly with a grin of her own. I do so love that we have people like Mrs. Bluet in our lives, Marilla. They give our lives such depth, don't they? Why, how empty would it be to threaten to send me away with someone cheery like Mrs. Spencer or Mr. Iverson? Anne said as she started drifting subtly into another of her tragic dream worlds. If you ever wear such a ridiculous display of flowers on your hat, then you'll have your wish. I'll send you away to be a drunken boxcar hobo like that Angus Iverson. Marilla scowled. All the other girls had corsages and bouquets pinned to their hats and coats. They had proper trimmed accoutrements. Marilla responded smartly, and Anne suddenly felt a tinge of guilt and shame. You had half my garden draped to your hat. You had vines and petals pell-mell. Well, Marilla, they seemed so moved by the sermon that they leapt into the loving hands of the Lord. Marilla sat stunned with little to no expression on her face. Anne watched as Marilla's gaze looked away from her slowly. Marilla was suffering from a new sensation. Every time Anne would do something outrageous, time would seem to stand still for a moment while she searched her very being for an answer to how she could possibly respond to such effrontery. Well, Marilla, I am sorry, Anne said after a moment of Marilla's stunned motionlessness. I never meant to bring shame to you or to the good people of Green Gables, which is just you and Matthew, but neither of you. We will forget about it, and I won't even threaten about sending you to the asylum. Marilla smiled. In fact, it's quite the opposite. I thought we'd head over the field to the berries, and you can meet their daughter Diana. It's high time you found some friends your own age. Oh, Marilla, I'm positively sick with worry. What if Diana doesn't like me? Anne said as she turned white as a ghost. I wouldn't worry so. Just keep to using small words and act like a lady. She will like you just fine. The one you have to worry about is her mother, Mrs. Berry. If her mother doesn't take a like to you, it won't matter what Diana thinks. Marilla said with a stone serious face that Anne could only read the boldest of intentions from. You must be polite. Act respectful, and be sure not to make any of your feather brain speeches. My word, child, you're actually shaking. Anne was stricken sick with worry. 
I never know how to handle these situations, Marilla. Should I put on an appearance or just be myself? What choice could you possibly have? (sighs) Enough of this. Marilla wilted, now with the beginning of a headache starting to come on that Mrs. Barry would eventually put the last nail into. Without another word, the two made their way up the greenest slope on Prince Edward Island. They made their way toward the berries down Orchard Slope. Diana could see them coming. Diana waved as she shoveled another mouthful of sherbet into her mouth. She smiled and waved and then stopped to wipe away from sherbet from her cheek. Is that Diana? Anne whisper screamed to Marilla. My yes. Anne couldn't help but notice that Diana was indeed strikingly beautiful, but she was also quite plump. Anne had never seen someone quite so sturdy looking her own age in her entire life. As Diana smiled, Anne was totally awestruck by her beauty. Anne approached the new girl, but she felt, as always, a little awkward in doing so. Her knees knocked a bit, and Anne looked back to Marilla for a bit of reassurance. She won't bite, Marilla stated boldly, and then whispered, As long as your arm isn't made of maple syrup poteen. (laughs) How do you do, Anne? Diana spoke clearly and proudly. She displayed absolutely impeccable manners and grace as she approached the shaking redhead orphan and took her by the hand. Anne couldn't respond. My Anne, you look absolutely ill. Anne swooned and sagged into Diana's large and soft arms and spoke softly. And make the fire and make the bread and earn her board and keep. (laughs) That's the little orphan Annie. Diana smiled. Oh my, I love that poem. I won't have you out here gaping at that poetry, Diana. Mind your manners. Why, hello, Marilla. Mrs. Barry entered the scene like a cannonball into a tower wall. This must be the new orphan girl we've all been hearing so much about. Marilla made her way up the slope slowly, but with a smile. Yes, Mrs. Barry, this is Anne. Anne with an E. Anne shouted a bit awkwardly, and everyone jumped just a bit. Well, child, how are you? Mrs. Barry asked with a furrowed brow. I am well in body, though considerably rumpled in spirit. Anne said plainly, and then turned to Marilla to obviously whisper. There wasn't anything too shocking in that, was there, Marilla? Marilla didn't say anything, but she sighed deeply and adjusted her cap. So you have met my daughter, Diana. She's been sitting around the estate, reading books, reciting poetry, and snacking all the day and night. I try and stop her, but her father aids and abets her. Perhaps having a proper play friend will get Diana out and about, and perhaps slim down a tinch. Diana scoffed and took Anne by the arm and marched the two through the almost unbelievable Berry Garden. It was the prize of Prince Edward Island and had very nearly every variety of botanical life available to the island. It was an intensely beautiful and rapturous moment for Anne, but she was far too nervous about her interactions with Diana to properly react. Diana, do you think it's possible that you might ever like me enough to one day be my bosom friend? Diana laughed playfully and said, (laughs) Sure, that sounds fine. Would you swear to be my best friend forever and ever? Anne asked presumptuously, and Diana looked back shocked at Anne. Isn't it wicked to swear? Diana blasted back with a scowl. Oh my no, not this kind of swearing. There are two kinds, you know? (laughs) I only know of just the one kind, and if my mother hears either of us saying shit, we'll never be able to be any kind of friend. (laughs) Well, this kind isn't wicked at all, Anne said with a wicked look in her eyes. Well, then, I don't mind doing this other thing, (laughs) Diana said, easily swayed. We must join hands and repeat a solemn swear to vow to each other, Anne said as she rose to her feet and offered both hands to Diana rigidly and purposefully. We will stand here next to the path and pretend it is the running and babbling waters. We'll both repeat the oath. I'll go first. Anne peered into Diana's blue eyes and saw deeply into her own future. As the images flashed in her mind, she said, I, Anne Shirley, with an E, 
solemnly swear to be faithful to my bosom friend Diana Barry for as long as the sun and moon shall endure. Now it's my turn to do the swearing. I, Diana Barry, with an A and a Y, solemnly swear to faithfully to my, um, what is that thing you keep saying? Bosom friend. Anne gave Diana her line with a cheery smile. My bosom friend for as long as the... <laughs> sun and moon. For as long as the sun and moon... <laughs> shall endure. Shall impure. Endure. I'm trying, but this is getting really silly, Anne. I'm getting hungry. Let's go raid the pantry. Diana chortled like a guilty old maid. Anne sat slack-jawed after watching Diana raid the kitchen of cookies and a pie tin of fudge squares with the deft tactical genius of a master cat burglar, right in front of her mother, who was scolding her at the time. Wow, Diana, this is fantastic, but I don't really have that much of a sweet tooth. Eating too many too often makes me sick. <laughs> Not me. I could eat them all and then go down for supper. Five courses tonight. Do you wish to stay? You could be my guest of honor. And... Marilla called up the stairs. We must get back soon. Matthew will be expecting supper. Come down, please. Coming, Marilla. Anne whisked down the stairs after giving Diana a sweet kiss on her plump cheek. And there you have it, chapter 12 from this KATR Classics. If you can believe it, there wasn't some sort of terrible calamity that ended things, so I'm sure chapter 13 will open with some sort of horrible tomfoolery. Uh, thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time.